Okay, um, so this is, I, I initially titled this talk uh, Introducing Julia to a Python C++ Scientific Computing Environment, but that was kind of a boring name I realized after the fact, so Julia rocks scientific computing. Um, and I'm, I'm really kind of glad to be uh, following Catherine Hyatt's talk because I'm gonna bang the same drum in a few places here at least. So uh, who am I? I'm a software uh, engineer, architect kind of person. I've been working for 18 years, um, mostly doing numerical and scientific computing. And I have some experience doing stats programming, uh, defense sector programming, financial sector programming. Um, and currently I work for a team that's the space situational awareness team at Numerica Corporation and uh, we track satellites. I'll talk more about that in a minute. Um, and uh, I've really been frustrated by the state of the art uh, in, in scientific computing in general, and so here's, here's some unfettered opinion about why. C++ has like this ill-conceived feature set, that these feature sets that overlap and can't work together, and it's hard to learn, write, and maintain. It's a pain. I know a lot of C++. It's not fun for me. Um, Java is verbose and not really great for numerical work. Python, elegant, I love it, um, but needs hybridization for speed. You have to drop to C a lot. R is like a DSL for doing stats, but not great for production code. Um, I'm going to offend everyone in the room at some point here. Um, <laughs> MATLAB, uh, you know, can be hard to scale and it's commercial. And Fortran's the original, but oh man, is it old? And then there's Julia. Woohoo! Okay, so. Um, Julia, to me, is like the scientific language. It's got its scientific batteries included. It's got this wonderful, clear, concise syntax. I can call C APIs directly with no overhead. Um, I can get this multi-process parallelism that, that scales to clusters, too. Um, I've got a Jupyter um, notebooks, and uh, you know, the, I get the best of both worlds. I can, I can write code that's like Python code, but I'm getting this type specialization that gives me this almost C-like performance in my code. So it's just great stuff. I'm really excited about it. Uh, the company I work for, Numerica, is in Fort Collins, Colorado. They have about 50 employees, um, a lot of math and physics and electrical engineering, computer science people, um, and yeah, about a little over half the researchers have PhD degrees. So it's, it's a very academic-y kind of a company, I guess. Um, and we solve problems in target tracking and sensor resource management and data compression and fusion. Um, and so usually our projects kind of look like this. <laughs> we, we're going to make this prototype code. And, you know, it used to be that we'd start in C++ and that fortunately got away from that years ago. But, you know, a lot of people will write Python or MATLAB code and then there's this maturation process if the project gets interesting and people really want the code and then you have to get it into C++ for production. And that maturation, of course, is a lot of work. Um, so we'll just, we'll, we'll set that aside for a minute and let me talk about space situational awareness. We have this tracker, which is basically, you know, given reports, detections of objects up in the sky, try to string them together into tracks that correspond to satellites or possibly pieces of space debris that orbit the earth. And we want to do this in all regimes of space. So like low earth orbit, all the way out to like a, a, a geosynchronous orbit type. We don't go much beyond that when we're looking at satellites. Um, and so, you know, we've got this program, we've got custom astrodynamics and all this stuff, and actually MFAST was first developed in Python and has since been translated to C++, so it follows that model. <laughs> um, so some interesting SSA problems I wanted to talk about for Julia, well, places that we're looking at maybe using it, we use this gauss hermite quadrature, which is kind of like better than Kalman filtering um, for, for certain problems. We use um, some optimization data, excuse me, optimization-based data association problems. We have uh, nonlinear least squares estimation. We have a numerical orbital propagator, and we do. Uh, we're working in some areas of conjunction analysis now. All these kinds of things look really interesting for a language like Julia. So, uh, kind of excited about that. And so, I've started doing some experiments with Julia, um, and I'm going to share a few of them here that relate to uh, conjunction analysis. And one is this parallel uh, ephemerides generation. Uh, which I'll talk about, and then performant multi-object proximity testing. And then I'm going to talk a little bit about hurdles to acceptance for Julia um, you know, in, in, in an environment like Numerica. So what's an ephemeris? It's you have some object in orbit, and you'd like to have a table that gives its position at various times. If we have x that's like a 6D dynamic state of the position and velocity of the object, then given the initial state at some time, we can propagate that to some future time and we can do this for any number of states and any number of times we care to do. So generating an ephemeris is just 
you know, I want to call this a whole bunch for a whole bunch of times and a whole bunch of objects and build me a huge table. Um, so you can actually do the multi-time propagation more efficiently if you don't propagate every piece separately. Um, there's, there's various reasons for this I'm not going to get into. But the problem I'd like to solve right now is I'd like to generate a table for 100,000 objects um, for every 15 minutes over a one-day period and just tell me where they're going to be according to this orbital propagator. So let's do that and let's make it run on a laptop. So a little bit of math, can we, is this a reasonable to fit in the memory of a laptop? Yes, it is, because a state's about 48 bytes. You're looking at 96 15-minute intervals throughout the day. And if you multiply it all out, it comes to about 460 megabytes to store this table in a dense array. So introducing some parallelization, I have a propagator that can accept 96 times at once. So basically, I can give it an object and all the times and get all the states back for where it's going to be. So I take my 100,000 objects and I divide them into some batches of 1,000. Each batch is a separate job. And then I say, oh, hey, Julia has this awesome parallel map thing I can just call. So I'm going to use that, and I'm going to plug in my propagation function and a whole batch of states. Or the, 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 actually, the, what, what it is is the, all, all of the batches of states. And then the map function is going to process one batch, and I can get back all the answers. So how did that work? Well. I ran it on eight cores of a MacBook and got about a 2.4 times speed up, which is mildly disappointing um, because, you know, we'd love to have an eight times speed up. So why didn't that happen? Well, there's message passing overhead. This is certainly a, a problem where there's a, a fair bit of computation occurring locally that does not need to be, you know, transmitted back. But you do have to have those 96 states come back for each object. So there's a fair bit of data going over um, between cores here, between processes, as, as it would be in Julia. And then eight cores is kind of lying because there's only four real cores. So maybe you know, a more reasonable expectation would have been like 4x. But I, if anybody can tell me you know, other reasons why I might not be seeing you know, the speed up I'd love to see, you know, maybe come talk to me after this, because I'd love to make it faster still. So what did Julia offer me there? Um, it allowed me to call my C++ propagator through a C interface incredibly easily. Um, it made it easy to distribute the jobs over eight cores, or presumably I could do this over a cluster, although I may need to make the data passing more efficient still. Um, and it did all the serialization and message passing behind the scenes for me. It was easy to write. This is worlds better than trying to do this with other tools. Uh, another problem that was interesting to me um, is uh, finding proximal objects. So here's the one. I, I like to give myself these challenges, you know, just kind of arbitrarily set time limits and see if I can beat them. Um, so given 100,000 positions in space, I'd like to find all the pairs that are within some radius dx, and I want to do that incredibly quickly, like well under a second. So approaches to this, if you're naive, and I can't believe Julia will actually do this for you in 27 seconds, by the way, like the fact that you can write the n squared loop over 100,000 objects and do that and get an answer in 27 seconds is kind of amazing. Um, but of course, People will come back and say, well, why aren't you using like, some kind of spatial indexing structure, like a KD tree or an octree tree or something like that? So I actually did that, and that was my first thought. I thought, oh, this will make it really fast. This will be the answer. It turned out not to be as good as I thought, because dynamically allocating the memory turned out to be the bottleneck still. So unless you're going to somehow flatten these trees into arrays or something like that, you're going to have this problem that you have to dynamically allocate a node, and you're generally going to have one node per object. So that's 100,000 nodes. So it turned out that the best approach was this procedure is just fixed size binning. And you pre-allocate your arrays. You say, here's an array of bin numbers. You have a function in one pass. You assign every object a bin number. And then you sort, it, you sort by the bin numbers. You can either sort the data directly, or you can build yourself a sorted index into the data. And that runs wicked fast. Um, Doing that and then locally comparing within bins and within neighboring bins, and you can kind of know what that's going to be based on strides, you get this complexity that's roughly the number of bins times the bin size square. But the bins are small if your DX is small. So results for that, I just did um, some Cartesian three-point distributed between 0 and 1, so this DX is relative to 1. And you know, even you know, all the way up to like 0 0.05 bin size, I'm doing it in 0.3 seconds. So you know, by the time you get to point one, you're really finding a heck of a lot of pairs at that point. So you kind of expect it to slow down because it actually, the work becomes lots of comparisons and generating lots of results. 30 seconds. All right, so what did Julia offer? Quick turnaround, great C-like performance, and wonderful stuff. Um, <laughs> hurrying up here, all these problems were part of all-in-all -all conjunction analysis, and um, it's some pretty cool stuff, and I'm hoping to use Julia more for that. 
Um, hurdles to acceptance. Um, a lot of people at the organization already know MATLAB and Python, so why Julia? Um, you know, is it too immature for production still? We have to deal with produ production code ultimately. Can we ship something that's in Julia? Today, probably not. I'd like to have that day come soon. Um, and then we have like some customers that just aren't used to that idea at all and they want Fortran and C++. So that's it. Hopefully we can overcome those hur hurdles and you know, there are some things that would be nice to have. So thank you. Any questions? Um, so the question is, uh, did I try to parallelize with fewer than eight workers? The answer is yes. I tried it with four as well, and um, I also got a very similar time. So that kind of does imply that, you know, and I don't know if there's a sweet spot below four, like if maybe somehow because of some other overhead, like three actually turned out to be better than four or something like that. I, I don't have that data. But it would be interesting to find out. Any other questions? I think there's one on the back. Oh, no, no, I'm sorry. Oh, oh Thank okay. Thank you very much for a very All right. Thank you.